What's up, everybody? Hoping we got some audio on here. Hello, hello, hello. You hear my wife back there playing it. All right. Let's see here. Good to see everybody. Hope y'all are looking forward to the stream here. What's up, Rich? What's up, Brandon? Should be some fun here. Today we're going to talk about fishing pressured waters, which, in my opinion, that's what Chickamauga is these days. If y'all go on a weekend, it's absolutely full of boats. Fished a tournament with uh, Mr. Randy Hooker last week, that catch tournament, and it was amazing to me how many boats were out there. There was multiple tournaments going on. That seems to be kind of the weekend theme nowadays. What's up, Garrett? Um, Twig, I, I talked last stream about kind of what's going to be the current conditions. I could talk about that a little bit today. So we're going to kind of jump into that. But in my opinion, we're going to talk more about today, just kind of the pressure. There's a lot of stuff that's going to be coming up, a lot of tournaments and things, especially this March is one of the most popular times to get on the lake. There's going to be so many boats out there. So we're going to talk a little bit today about how to be successful, even if there's 100 million boats on the water. A lot of you guys I know are probably weekend warriors. I try to do my fishing during the week if I possibly can just to kind of avoid all that. <laughs> What's up, Randy? Uh, let's see here. Ryan, if you're going to make a trip down here, the water is dirty um, and it's it's staying relatively stable. I figured it'd be much higher than it is already, but I think with this next couple rains that we're going to, I know we're supposed to get more rain tonight and I think tomorrow maybe a couple more days, so I'm expecting the water level to rise. Honestly, I thought it was going to be more like summer pool by this point, but from what I'm seeing now, we're maybe two or three feet higher, so we're still four feet or so below summer pool at this moment, um, but you're going to be fishing dirty water and a lot of current. What's up, Bass Lives Matter? What's up, man? I'm going to do your, your uh, breakdown on Lake Monroe. I'm thinking I'm actually going to make it a video, though, just for the sake of live. And I'm going to call you and I'm going to talk with you about that because I had some questions on kind of some general information about the lake. There's not a whole lot online about that lake, and I just don't want to break it down thinking it's a different lake than it actually is. Randy says they slowed the flow, I believe it. All right, let's jump into this. So we're going to talk about kind of adjusting and what you need to do when you're fishing pressured water in order to catch more fish. So the first thing I put on here, and this applies to me too, but be courteous. If y'all wanna follow along as always, down in the description of the video, you're gonna find the outline I have for the videos. All these videos should have an outline down there. You can copy and paste it, print it off, whatever. But one thing I noticed out on the lake lately is there's a lot of guys, and myself included, I've done this unintentionally several times, where I'll pull up and I feel like I'm too close to somebody or you know, they're not comfortable with where I'm at. I miscommunicate with them or misthink in my mind where they're going and they're really wanting to fish a different area. So one of the biggest things I, I, I see out there, and I think a lot of guys need to pay attention to, myself included, is just, you know, at the end of the day, fishing's supposed to be fun. When you're out there, be courteous to the other boats. Communicate with the guys in the other boats, you know, ask them where they're going, what their plans are, so you can kind of fish around them and not, you know, cause tempers to flare. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, and, and there's some guys – I mean, last year, you know, I remember specifically, I pulled up to one of my brush piles that I fish in kind of Harrison Bay area, caught one six and a half pounder, and there was four boats literally drove right over to me, dropped their trolling motors and cast away and start fishing in the same area. I had no idea what they're fishing, but it just, that kind of stuff frustrates me. And a lot of times, you know, guys won't even say anything to you. I'm like, I don't mind if someone comes up and says, like, hey, dude, you know, mind if I fish over here with you? I don't care. If someone comes up to me and it's kind enough to ask me that, that's great. But when, when guys will just kind of ease their way right in next to you and start casting, they don't say a word to you. Act like you're not even there. I'm just like, come on, man. Or idle right over top of where you're fishing. You know, I had a guy in a video I think I put out last uh, spring during the shad spawn. <laughs> I was catching fish after fish off a, a shallow point right in front of me. We're talking like three, four feet of water. And behind me is... You know, there's a cut in a pocket right there, and there's the channel right there. Well, instead of 
idling behind me where the channel was, this guy decides to idle right over the pocket, like halfway, half a cast between me and the fish in three to four foot of water and spooks him. And I just kind of look at him like, dude, what are you doing? I just don't understand that. But anyway, enough whining about that. But just, you know, another thing with uh, being courteous is being patient. You know, let a guy fish out an area. It, what that does is a lot of times it'll let those fish kind of slow down in that area. They'll get to reset, and you can go back through and catch fish out of there yourself. Um, there's no secrets on this lake anymore. So you got to be courteous with other people, and you got to be thinking ahead. Now, one thing that I always try to do when I get out into the water, you know, we talk about fish in the moment a lot, and that's extremely important. But to begin with, you need to have a plan of what you're going to do on the water, especially if it's tournament day. You know, this really got me thinking fishing this derby the other day, but if it's tournament day, you have to have kind of an idea of what you're doing in advance. You don't just have one spot that you're going to pull up on and think you're going to catch your fish for the tournament. If you're thinking that on this lake, you're going to get beat up pretty badly because chances are there's going to be three or four or five boats sitting in that area. So you have to have backup plans. You got to think about timing and things like that. So that always gives me confidence to know, I've got maybe 10 or 12 places I know I can catch some fish, right? So that's my, my tournament idea in my head. That's 10 or 12 places. I want to have, you know, some areas in mind that I don't think there'll be near as many fish on, or not fish, sorry, near as many people on. So in other words, some kind of off-the-wall stuff that I can start on. To me, that's the biggest thing. If, if I'm going to start in a spot, I want it to be a spot I feel like I'm going to be alone or relatively close to being alone. So having that off-the-wall stuff, you can sneak over there and – uh and do your deal. Thanks, baby, for the two bucks there. <laughs> uh, let's see here. But let's see here. Yeah, that's the main thing for me is you can plan ahead for the pressure and the pressured areas. You should know which areas are kind of community holes and things like that. If you're practicing for tournaments, technically you're gonna you're probably gonna see guys in those areas, so you know you're gonna have competition. So plan ahead for that and. And, and think about the areas, you know, every spot has the juicy spot, right? So you might have an area that's good. Maybe there's a, a spot on a flat that's a really good area. Well, maybe in that spot, there's one or two stumps that really tend to hold fish or maybe a small rock pile. Really pay attention to the boat ahead of you because, you know, if there's a guy ahead of you, don't jump in front and cut him off. You know, just watch him, see what he does. You can follow him behind, do something a little different and let him do his deal through there. And what I've found most of the time is, a lot of guys will either they'll run right over top of the fish a lot of times, they'll fish a little bit differently in an area than I would, or they'll miss the, the juice, so to speak. And so I can let them fish through that area, calmly take my time, kind of defensively, you know, hold other people off of that spot, let it settle down, then I can go through and hit that juicy spot, and maybe get a few bites off of it. Usually it's not as good as it would have been if it would have been like a weekday, you know, and nobody had run over it. Cause to me, that trolling motor guys put their sonars on a lot in two three foot of water all that makes a difference in catching these fish when they're heavily pressured um, another thing i put on here point number three is think outside the box um, <clears throat> the big thing to me again like we talked about just because there's a boat in front of you doesn't mean that you need to hurry up and rush up and cut them off and get into new water the, the boat in front of you a lot of times is doing something completely different than you are you know there's the old saying that it's nothing's harder than going and catching somebody else's fish, right? So if you went over there and you tried to do the same thing he was doing, he would probably outfish you. But if he came over here and was trying to do the same thing you were doing, you would probably outfish him. Everybody has their own confidence, their own way of fishing things. So don't let it get in your head that there's a guy in front of you there. Let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and look at some questions over here. Uh, when you say... When do you say something to people that are crowding you or pulling into your spot? Uh, I would think prevention is best, but if they're already there, it's kind of a mute point. Um, if someone pulls in right on top of me, most of the time, I don't really, I'm, I'm not really a confrontational person like that. I'm not going to start something with somebody. If they want, in my opinion, if they want the spot that bad, you know, I'm fishing for fun. It's not like I'm out there fishing for $100,000. Um, if they want the spot that bad and they want to run over me and they're willing to live with themselves doing that, you know, they can have it. I've, I've known this like my whole life. I've got plenty of other spots I can go fish. Uh, now, if they're doing something unsafe or silly or something like that, then fine. I remember specifically there was one day I was fishing a pocket that had a bar that cut way across. So in other words, the point came way out. And at that point, 
the water was dropped extremely low. So this point, you can imagine it cutting across almost across the entire pocket. And you have literally inches of water. We're talking 10 to 14 inches of water on top of this thing. And I'm behind it. I've gone through the ditch. I'm fishing behind. I'm fishing the backside of this little bar, basically, that's created right there. And <clears throat> catch a few fish. A boat sees me catching the fish. They start running on plane straight over to me. Gonna, I guess they were planning on running to the back of that pocket. And as they get closer, I realize these guys are not going to stop. So they're going to end up ruining their lower unit on this big fancy boat, right? <clears throat> so they're running down and I jump up and start waving my hands. I'm like, stop, stop, stop. And the dude literally sits down right before he's about to, to bust up his, his daddy's boat right there. He sits down and literally stands up. He's, he looks at me. He goes, what's the matter? You think you own the whole effing lake? And I'm like, no, I'm just trying to keep you from ruining your boat, dude. Like that That's the kind of stuff that ticks me off. I'm like, I'm not going to. I don't know. I'm not going to get confrontational about something like that. But if someone's about to ruin their stuff, if I say something and they get an attitude about it, I'm like, come on, man. We're out here having fun. Leave it alone. Let's see here. But let's see here. Again, thinking outside the box. So have confidence to fish behind somebody. You know, if they're up there throwing a red trap, well, you can go behind them and you can throw a sartreuse trap or you can throw a different brand of trap. You can throw, you know, one that sounds different. So I put on here, use different lures, use different presentations, different colors, sounds, styles. There's a whole lot of things that you can do to catch fish behind people. The main thing is, it's just the amount that you have to understand that the amount of pressure that's on those fish, you might not go in there. Say it's a point that a couple days before you pulled up and you caught 20 fish off of, well, you might not expect to do that again. You might pull up and expect to pull five fish off of that point and then go to another one. Let's see. <clears throat> All right. Now, next point. Point number four. Um, let's see here. Learn good defense. And, and again, I say this within the context of being courteous. You know, it's not like I've had guys that had good defense where they'll cut you out of an entire pocket that's like five or six acres. And you can tell they're trying to cut you off from going back. And I'm like, dude, are you fishing this side or this side? You know, don't, don't think that you can have five, six, seven acres to yourself on this lake. But you can still be defensive. Say, again, we're out on a, a point or a flat or a saddle, and there's one specific area that you want to fish, and you want to keep boats off of it. You know, in my mind, I don't want as much pressure on there, you know, guys sitting right on top of it or running over that. You know, a lot of guys might fish that wrong. You don't want guys running over that spot. So I can kind of guard that area, especially if there's a boat that's already gone through. I can kind of sit back and sit a cast and a half or two casts away from that area and kind of keep people going around it without fishing it, give those fish time to settle down, pull onto the spot and make a cast. To me, that's good defense. To me, um, not good defense would be trying to cut somebody off to an entire back of a creek or a pocket or something like that. You're, you're just not going to be able to do that without getting into confrontation with somebody and really being disrespectful to them. You, none of us own the water, so best thing you can do is try to be defensive in a courteous manner, in my opinion. And again, I'm talking again, just communicating with somebody. You know, if you pull up and you're like, hey, dude, we're both fishing the same slough right here, okay? Are you fishing? I can obviously see he's fishing that bank over there. Are you fishing down through there? What's your plan? Are you turning around up there? That's great. Then I can know this guy, he intends to fish the back of this pocket. So for me, it would be rude, in my opinion, to run straight to the back of the pocket and start fishing there. That's already his plan. I always tell people, if you're going to fish a spot on this lake, go directly to that spot and fish, especially if it's tournament today, because a guy will literally, he'll run right in front of you and drop it. Everybody knows around here, if you're going to fish a spot, you drop yourself right on top of it. So don't think that you're going to fish into an area. But if you do decide that, or you think that somebody else has, communicate with them and just you know back up if you need to. <clears throat> Another thing that I look for is different lines, different timing. So I guess point number five here, we're going to go into timing. So fishing, you know, again, within the grand scheme of the plan, you know, we've got a plan on how we're doing this. Um, the timing of it, you know, there's bite windows, especially in the colder water. This time of year, I've noticed the fish really get into bite windows. So maybe they're eating that first two hours of daylight. Maybe they're eating early afternoon. You know, there's usually a few points where the fish really tend to bite. Or if you're in shallow water, in other words, fishing for shallow fish, maybe if they're main lake shallow fish, there'll be only a certain time they'll kind of pull up into these shallow feeding areas and pull back down. 
So you have to understand that within the grand scheme of things and know in your mind, if you're on a pressured body of water, there's probably been a bunch of boats. You know, a guy caught fish there last week. So he goes fishes it, another guy, another guy, another guy. And they've been running over these fish most, most likely because a lot of times those fish will sit in a ditch or something. And they'll be suspended. They've been running over them. So you have to understand timing is important. You got to get out there and you got to get on those fish, but don't be expecting as much as you would during the week, in my opinion, most of the time. And again, you can talk about if you're in an important tournament or something, you know, and say you've only got a few areas and you've got one key area, you know you can catch some big fish. Again, that defense strategy, you might actually sit off there and fish that ditch, even though those fish are spread out and much harder to catch. <clears throat> slow down, go to something finessey, and hold other people off of that key structure or cover that you're fishing until that bite window comes to pass, you know, and once you get that bite window, you can pull up there and catch those fish. Um, Justin says, what do I look for when I um, fish a hump or a ditch? The biggest thing for me when I'm fishing a hump is something that's, you know, there's so many humps out there that don't really hold fish. And there's also a lot of humps that are in different um, parts of the lake. So in other words, the biggest thing I'm looking for is the grand scheme of things. Where are those fish seasonally right now? Say it's wintertime. They're out towards the mouth of the creek. So I'm not going to fish a hump that's in the very back of the creek. I'm not going to fish a hump that's, you know, way up in a, uh, a flat area, you know, a spawning bay or something like that. That's not an area where I'm expecting to find fish, right? Vice versa, if you're further along in the year and you're in the late pre-spawn, well, that's when I'm not going to fish a hump that's out at the mouth of the creek. I'm going to fish the one that's in the back. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the overarching scheme. <clears throat> as far as the, the makeup of the hump itself, what I like to find is – you know, if I'm looking for an area to fish, I want a smaller hump. You know, a lot of times you get these gigantic ones. A smaller hump to me is an easier place to find fish. They have a smaller area they can go to. You can find that juice, the key spot on that hump faster. And I want something with hard bottom. If it has grass on it, good, but hard bottom is a must, whether it's got grass on it or not. A ditch, the same thing. I want it, a, a ditch, for me to fish a ditch, it has to be again within the the strategy of where those fish are in relation to the time of the year and um, their cycles and things like that. So <clears throat> if I'm finding a ditch, I'm not going to fish, you know, way up there. If the fish are not there yet, I'm going to fish in relation to where the fish should be, find those fish and I'm, I'll fish that ditch in relation to a hump or a bar or anything else. Uh, I noticed with the ditches, you want something again, that hard bottom close by, and you want to fish areas where those fish are going to be. You know, when they pull up to feed, a lot of times they're pulling up onto those hard bottom areas. So you want to be close by to that. You want to look for turns, for cuts, for grass. Notice a lot of times ditches will have grass in them. That can be a good spot to find them. <clears throat> um, let's see, Mike says, if you caught fish in a spot the day before, how likely is it? will it be that the fish will reload should that spot be the first target of the second day? That's a good question. And I, I guess the answer to that would be sometimes. Um, <clears throat> if I'm in an area, and here's the thing. Say in this context, say you're practicing for a tournament. So you pull up to a point and you catch a fish off of it. To me, at that point, you still don't know whether those fish are going to be there tomorrow. You don't really know how many fish are in there. So what I often do is I'll make that second cast into there. Um, this is a good example during that tournament, the day before that tournament that we fished over there, I pulled up to a shallow point, fired out there, got on my little waypoint there, and I knew there was a juicy spot out there. There's a couple cinder blocks sitting on this point. I fire out there, make my cast, and pulling that lipless through there. Bam. I got an extremely violent bite. I, first of all, I bumped a fish, then got an extremely violent bite. And that fish, when it took it, it literally jumped slack in the line. So it was running at me. And to me, for a fish to grab something like that, and then to start running away with it really fast, that immediately says in my mind, competition. In other words, to me, immediately I'm thinking in my head, this is probably not the only fish there. And sure enough, I pull that fish in a little over five pounds, fire back out there the next cast just to see and verify. Again, exact same lineup, same cast, set the hook, starts ripping, dragging, head shaking. I didn't ever get to see that fish. It was a lot bigger, it pulled off. But immediately I knew, I was like, okay, back off this spot. I can tell there's a lot of fish there. And they should reload. In my case, unfortunately, they would drop the water a foot overnight. And so those fish that were up shallow had pushed off. So you have to always understand that. What's up, Hank? 
Got Bass Geek on here. Y'all need to go check him out and subscribe. He's the man. Um, so I guess whether you would target that spot the second day is related to how many fish you think are in that area. If it's an area where those fish, and it's a time, you know, when you get to that pre-spawn period, the big fish a lot of times will group together. You go in there and do what I did, that's a spot I would definitely hit that next day and list conditions have changed a whole lot. If you go in there and you catch one random fish and then another random fish, the likelihood of them being on there, you don't know. And you don't know either anyway because those fish are moving during that time period. So you might pull up there, there might be a big school one day, second day there's a big school there, third day they're all gone. They've pushed on to the next spot in their little migration route. Scott, that's a good answer to him right there. Scott says this time of year the fish really group up and should stay close to where you found them the day before. And I agree with that. In a lot of cases, they do do that. Let's see here. Bass lives matter. Yeah, exactly, dude. I've had that happen so many times. You know, I always say tournament day is different than practice day, and that is definitely true. And another thing that, that you don't understand, or a lot of guys don't understand on the Tennessee River, is most of the time on the weekend, they change the current up dramatically, especially during the warmer months. So when they're running a normal kind of a, a high current, say it's 46,000 gallons per minute or hour, however they calculate that. And then on the weekend, they might only run 12,000. So that can completely mess up your pattern and your bite windows and everything. So a lot of times you just, you can't really, you know, again, we say plan as much as possible, but then fish the moment after that. You're going to have to get out there and find those fish. What's up, Eric? Let's see here. We're going to go on down. Point number six here. Take a different line. That has nothing to do with fishing line. What I noticed, and we kind of talked about this a little bit before, I noticed so many times when a guy's fishing a pocket or a flat, they'll go through and they'll fish along the bank or they'll fish an inside edge. Well, there's so many different lineups. A lot of times if you're on a big flat, well, there's going to be a bunch of secondary flats in there. There's going to be a bunch of secondary ditches. So if you know about those and the guy takes one, well, you know, you can take the other ditch and go through there and catch new fish, especially in a bigger area like that. Or if a guy fishes a pocket, he goes straight down the bank, starts flipping in there. We had good examples during that tournament. Randy and I fished, had a guy pull up and start flipping down a little bit deeper transition bank right there. We pulled in behind him. Uh, Randy knew about a ditch that was kind of a little bit further out. We swung out. I noticed a bunch of bait fish activity out there, and I was like, Randy, I think, I think the fish are out there. Sure enough, since the water had fallen, a lot of those fish were in the center. So we were actually able to go behind two or three boats and catch a couple key fish in that pocket because we took a different lineup, took a different approach to fishing that area than the other guys did. And another thing I put on here is give the fish time to settle down. If you're taking a different line, especially if a guy has run over where you think those fish are. So if they're going down that line, you, you think the fish are pulled out in the center of a ditch. The guy runs over the ditch to fish the bank there. He's run right over top of their heads. A lot of times he's spread them out a little bit. You can sit there and, and hang back just a little bit further behind him, not to where somebody's going to pull in front of you, but you can hang back, fish kind of finesse you through there, give those fish, especially in a key area. Again, I'm talking about key areas. You have to fish the high percentage stuff harder. So give those time just a little bit, those fish a little time right there, swing into it, and then start to catch those fish right behind those people. Now we're going to talk about different ways to catch the fish. So now we talk about how to deal with the pressure, how to find those fish. Now how do you actually get them to react? Now there's two different schools of thought. Now y'all need to go check out Mikey Ball's channel. He's been doing several videos on this because there's a bunch of Googans, as he calls them, that have kind of ripped off a bunch of his stuff down there in Florida and made life difficult for him this year. In the past, he's had a lot of that to himself, and he's starting to get the kind of the Chickamauga syndrome down there on that deep lake that he fishes in Florida. So go check his videos. He has some good things to say about that. I'm going to kind of give my take on it. You know, there's two different schools of thought. If you're going behind somebody and fishing, a lot of times, again, those fish are feeling the pressure. They're not necessarily in a biting mood anymore. A lot of times they're still a little bit wary of what's going on around them. They've just been spooked. So there's a couple ways that you can get those fish to eat. 
One of them is to use reaction style baits, which is honestly what I prefer. A reaction, you know, a reaction style bait or technique is a technique that's going to prey on that fish's instincts. You're trying to get that fish to commit without really wanting to. It's not really that they're trying to eat or, you know, consume that bait. They're just lashing out at it because it's right in front of them. It's doing something that in their mind it's supposed to be doing and they have to bite it. And then the other school of thought is to go ultra finesse if you're behind somebody. So in other words, slow way down, you know, use smaller baits, use smaller line and, and really pick that area apart and catch fish. Both of them work very well. So we're going to kind of jump into those. For me, for reaction fishing, you know, when the fish are feeling the pressure in small areas, um, again, they're not actively feeding. So you're trying to force feed them. A lot of times what I'm doing there is I'm using like something, crankbaits. You know, Mikey talks about in his videos using crankbaits. That's an awesome technique to get a reaction bite. And you would think that's kind of a power fishing thing. You know, somebody just fished through there is something that invasive and that much of a power technique really going to get those fish to bite. And it really can in a lot of cases. The key there is to use stall. So, you know, they talk about tactical bass a lot, rate of stall. You know, that's how long you're letting that bait sit there in front of that fish. So by stalling some of those reaction baits, pulling them really fast, popping them a lot, and just getting general deflection, you know, with a crankbait, you have to deflect off the things to get bites. So if you know there's a boulder in there, you can run that crankbait down there, you know, a lot faster and aggressively and get it to really deflect and cut out across where those fish are. And when it does something different like that, a lot of times that's when those fish will decide to bite it. Um, I use a trap a lot of times, you know, so I see a lot of guys will be fishing down a bank. They'll be running that trap through there, you know, just steady retreat, or they'll be burning and stopping it, or they'll be doing something else. Well, I might go through there and I know in my mind, I'm like, this is where the fish should be. If there's a school of fish there, this is where they'll be. Again, we talked about some of those techniques, you know, I'll fire that thing in there, let it sink into the middle of where those fish are and I'll get crazy with it. Kevin Van Dam style, you know, ripping that rod, doing crazy stuff, letting it sit on the bottom, ripping it again, sit on the bottom. And when you do that, a lot of times it'll, it's completely different to the fish. I, honestly, I think it just catches them off guard and they'll come up and they'll tag that bait like that. So just being different and it, with those reaction baits, doing something wild, a lot of times can get those fish to react to that bait. You know, burning your uh, crankbait through there after somebody's already fished through there can really work. Taking a spinner bait, say a guy flipped down a, a you know a row of trees. Well, you take a spinner bait, you know, a big invasive spinner bait, and you start banging it through those trees as much as you possibly can, hitting those limbs and things like that. Or square bill, banging it through there. You know that a lot of times will get those fish to eat. And the flip side of that again is the finesse fishing. So you can go through there, and sometimes those fish are get they get so spooked and they're so finicky after they've been fished for over and over again that you have to go super finesse. And when you do this, you know, I'm thinking like a drop shot. I don't really throw a Ned rig, but like a blade bait, you know, something like that, that you can slow way down with. I like to fish a little grub a lot of times or a really small single swim bait. And you can go back through and pick apart those areas. And I'm talking fishing slow. Again, key areas. I'm going, and I'm like, if there's a school of fish here, that's where that school of fish will be. I'll fire in there, and that's when you can really use a slow technique because you know you can soak that bait in there. When you, We're talking about soaking a bait. It's just sitting there. You know, you might pull it a little bit, leave it in one spot. Pull it a little bit, leave it in one spot. You'd be surprised how long you'll start feeling awkward. You know, your bait's been sitting there so long. You know, a finesse jig or something's been sitting there so long. And then finally that fish will pick it up. To get drop shot, same thing. This time of the year, I don't get crazy with a drop shot. You know, a lot of guys in the summer are twitching that thing, going crazy with it. In the wintertime, you can literally just pull it through there. Or another sneaky technique is you can take a little Kytec or a small swim bait and just nose hook it, and you can reel it real slow. So it's not sitting right on the bottom. It sits right up off the bottom on that drop shot, and you can basically really finesse swim bait fishing area ultra slow, slower than you can reel most swim bait heads through there and keep bottom contact. All right, point number eight is going to a color change. Again, the guy's in front of you. You can see what he's throwing. If he's throwing a red trap and it's dirty water, you can go through there and throw an orange trap or like a more of a methylate looking trap or a sartreuse trap or something different. You know, just do something a little different than the guy ahead of you. And a lot of times the, the weird thing is in even in clear water, you can go to something really bright and invasive. You know, Alex and I talk about this a lot. 
You know, so it's even in clear water. You can go in there and throw a pink crankbait behind a guy that's throwing an ultra natural crankbait and maybe outfish the heck out of him or at least get some bites behind him because it's something completely different than that fish has seen that day or probably in a long time. And then the other school of thought on, you know, color changes is to go ultra realistic. And when I say ultra realistic, it's not necessarily that it's, you know, an, an exact replica, you know, like one of those crank wrap kind of deals. To me, ultra realistic, a lot of times is that ultra translucent color, you know, the, like the smoke colors, they look like bluegill colors. They're extremely translucent. Um, I broke down some of those colors in that trap video if y'all wanna go back and watch that, but those ultra translucent colors, you can slow down and catch those fish using that. And when you're talking about plastics or jig trailers, like a watermelon color versus a green pumpkin color, and you can get super, super realistic and really slow down and catch those fish that way. Another way to do it is with a sound change. So, you know, we talked about this before again. You've got baits that sound completely different. Say a guy's throwing a crankbait in front of you, you look at it and you're like, hey, that kind of looks like a Booyah one knocker or something. Well, I'm gonna throw a red eye shad behind him or actual Bill Lewis rattle trap, something with some different sound on it. Like, that makes all the difference in the world sometimes, just something with different sound. Um, sometimes going in there fishing something silent. You know, right behind a guy can really get them to, you can catch fish right behind somebody. So just changing some little things can make a huge difference. And you just, again, you have to fish the moment, but you also have to fish with confidence. And a lot of times you can get these bites no matter what. Uh, O'Brien's over here. He's like, get that six cents quake out. Yeah, he, he likes to fish that thing. I've seen him catch fish on it. I have yet to have like an awesome day with that lipless bait. And again, I'm not a big Booyah guy or Excalibur guy. I just haven't had, haven't had those great, incredible days with those baits where I've just thought, wow, this is like the deal now. And then point number 10 I put on there is again, present the bait differently. You know, we talked about this a second ago, going back through there, fishing a little differently than the guy ahead of you. Always pay attention to that. You know, you should be, we talked about this in the last stream, pay attention to everything that's going on around you. So example from that tournament we were watching what the guys were doing ahead of us we were watching their the lines they were taking the presentations they were using the types of baits they were using and then on top of that we were watching the entire pockets of the entire area that we were fishing looking at bait fish busting out there looking at crappie rolling they're all in the center everybody's fishing the outside edges so we just pulled into the center hit the ditches and started catching fish let's see here Douglas says, LV500. We don't talk about that. That's, that's secret stuff right there. Yeah, LV500 is awesome. A lot of times, though, when these fish get ultra, ultra, ultra shallow in the uh, pre-spawn like this, it's hard to get an LV500 through like two foot of water without getting it hung up, though. All right, we're going to go back through and start answering some questions. I apologize. I'm sure guys have been or asking questions this whole time. So I'm going to kind of go back through here. Got a little bit of time. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Brian says the tail waters below the dam right now look like a scene from the deadliest catch. And you're absolutely right. It was crazy to me, you know, they had the floodgates open right now with all this rain. And I was watching, they put a lock in, they use these big cylinder things to kind of create the lock. And between them, obviously there's a gap where those cylinders come together. And the water was hitting them so hard, it was shooting water like a water feature up like 60 feet right in those areas. And I'm like, I wouldn't want to be down there right now. You couldn't pay me money to do that. Let's see here. Oh, Eric says it's going to be interesting down this weekend. Yeah, it's going to be. I have no idea what this weekend is going to hold. I still haven't signed up for the Big Bass Splash just because I can't tell what's going to be happening um, the weather forecast is all over the place. I can't decide whether I'm going to be fishing that or not. My worst nightmare is there's going to be a cold front that's going to come through. The water is going to be dropping and it's going to be stained water. And I don't know if I'll fish it if that's if that's the case. Um, Scott Tarpley says they should be tight to cover this weekend. Um, I would say yes and no. It depends on the area of the lake you're fishing. If you're in an area that's going to be ultra dirty, I think a lot of the creeks will be super, super dirty, like Yoohoo chocolate milk color. In that case, I would say definitely get up, start flipping something, um, throwing a square bill, throwing a big spinner bait. But 
I think a lot of the main lake flats and areas are going to be very stained, but they'll still be in that, you know, plus a foot visibility range. And if they're like that, those fish could still be offshore. They could be on a lot of structure versus the cover stuff. <laughs> Rich says, Googans are everywhere. You're no kidding, buddy. I mean, that's that's the name of the game now. I just hope that, especially a lot of the older guys out there, you know, we said there's so many young anglers on the water right now. We set the example for them. So, you know, if some young guy pulls up on you, it's not a good time, in my opinion, to go losing your temper on some young, you know, high school or college age kid. It's time to teach them kind of in a respectful manner um, the way they should be doing things, you know. In other words, have a calm conversation with them and just kind of talk through things and maybe teach them a little something that they haven't been taught yet. Any coaches out there, definitely teach your kids that because, you know, we're teaching the new generation how we're fishing. So any guys, the older guys, we're setting the example. We're out there cussing each other and not communicating and running right over top of each other. These high school kids are going to see the same thing and start doing the same thing, and things are just going to get worse over the years. Tweak said he was on Gunnersville next four days. It could be good, dude. Again, Gunnersville is kind of similar to Chickamauga. It's got a lot of flats on it, got a lot of grass. That grass cleans up water pretty quick. You know, you get into that stained water, you can start ripping a trap through there, find some decent water clarity, and find offshore fish when other guys are sitting there beating the bank. Could be the, the best few days of your life. Rich says, I really should try a Ned Rig. I just cannot. I, I fished it. I've got a bunch of them, and I fished it a little bit. I cannot bring myself. And I told a guy this the other day. I was like, you know, if they get down to the Ned Rig bite here, especially when I'm, I'm talking like the little bitty Ned Rig, the little TRD, if it gets down to that point, hey, I can go fish in the next couple days, right? I mean, I'll just pop off of there. I get really stubborn. I'm blessed. To, my wife is awesome she lets me fish several days a week so if they're not biting real good i'll grind it out and i'll just go find fish i'll start graphing i love to do that too i'll go find some fish i don't have to sit there and slow down to catch them but i understand completely guys that you know it's the only day of the week you get to fish you got to find a way to make it happen and catch those fish so slowing down and doing something like that could be the best way to do it to me though I haven't ever had to really go to that point. There's not been a whole lot of days that I've zeroed. I can pull out a blade bait. I can pull out a shad wrap. I can pull out a really small finesse jig, um, a small, uh, let's see here, small shaky head or something like that and still catch fish. I haven't really gotten to that point where I felt like I have to catch, you know, have to throw the Ned rig or, or I'm going to die here. <laughs> Twig says, do I ever throw solid white in muddy water? A lot of times in stained water, I will throw solid white. When I'm talking stain, I'm talking still very muddy, but you know, when I have maybe a foot to a foot and a half visibility, um, I like a solid white blade on a spinner bait or white and sartreuse blade on a spinner bait. It tends to be really good during that time. But as far as throwing white in chocolate milk, it's not really a confidence for me. To me, I'm gonna switch to a red, I'm gonna switch to a methylate, an orange, sartreuse. Um, something like that. I feel like you get a little bit more presence in there. Another another color I really like in stained water, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last couple videos, but throwing a gold can be amazing in stained water. Let's see here. Do I know Andy Lusk? I don't really know Andy. I can't say that I, I know him personally. I sat there and spoke with him with a little bit, a little bit of time at the catch tournament that I fished with Randy, but I wouldn't say that I know him personally. All absolute, all the, the Lust brothers are hammers, fishermen. Let's see here. Mike Kovacs again asked, uh, talking about adjustments, how long do you fish a bait before switching to a different one or different color? Um, Chris and I make fun of each other all the time. Cycling, cycling, you know. When we get out on a spot, I like to have multiple rods tied up, multiple different techniques that I don't uh, think are going to work in that area. And I will pre-rig in advance. Say I've only got two trap rods. I know I'm going to a dirtier area of the lake. I'll tie on two different traps for dirtier water. And it does not take me long at all. When I get to a key area, I go through there, maybe a fish bumps it. Maybe I don't get a bite. I'm immediately going to fire something else out there, and I'm trying to, again, get as much feedback from those fish as quickly as possible. Once I start getting feedback, then I'll start slowing down, getting confidence in certain 
colors or techniques and really working it through. Really, that boils down to, again, confidence. You know, once you get confidence that one thing is working, you can catch fish on it. However, I like to make sure, you know, if you got two guys in the boat, you know, it really pays to kind of make sure and verify that that's the color or technique that the fish really want. And it can change from area to area. So just because you caught 90% of your fish that day on a sartreuse trap doesn't mean that when you pull up to this next point, the best thing to throw in there is not going to be a, you know, a double willow spinnerbait or something like that. Don't ever count yourself out because conditions change through the day, the light changes through the day, and what the fish are eating can change dramatically throughout the day as well. (laughs) DIY bass fishing, (laughs) hit those ditches. Yep, I agree with you completely there. Um, Douglas Edwards, cotton cordell for shallow fish. And I cannot agree with you more. That cotton cordell spot is an amazing lipless bait for just burning around. You know, and the the Bill Lewis too is awesome bait. Another another one that my grandfather catches a ton of fish on is when it gets ultra, ultra shallow is that floating Bill Lewis trap. That's one a lot of guys don't talk about, but that's a really good way to catch a bunch of fish. Let's see here. Gee, Sean says five to seven inches of rain and severe storms expected on Saturday. That's insane. If we get another five to seven inches, I would be extremely, extremely surprised, especially just over the weekend. I would be really surprised if we didn't get to summer pool. David Cook says, what's the best time for big swim baits? Um, If you're wanting to fish big baits, you're typically going to be in your warmer weather. In, In other words, your warmer water temperatures, anywhere from that. In mid 50s to about 65 degrees tends to be your best time to be throwing really big baits. A lot of guys, if you're just talking about bottom bouncing, you know, or ultra, ultra slow, you know, creeping a hood, ultra, ultra slow, um, then you can fish that all the way into the winter and, and let, you know, really see this year, we really haven't gotten that extreme cold temperatures. And you think, to me, I think that a lot of times that really helps that bite. When the fish get predictable, they get deep, and I can just crawl that thing through there. That's when I'm confident throwing that big bait through there. When they're spread out everywhere, I'm going to be covering water with some kind of a moving bait. Let's see here. Two kayak tournaments and, and one boat tournament this weekend. Be safe. Yeah, definitely. Boaters out there, be watching for those kayakers, guys. There's a whole lot more kayakers on the river now. A lot of guys fish in these backwater areas, and it scares me to death. We have all these really narrow creek systems, and if you're running a bass boat 70 miles an hour through a little creek system, there's a chance you could end up colliding with a kayak angler. So be careful out there. Be paying attention, especially in low light. Don't be running and going wild in the fog and stuff like that because – a lot of bad things can happen. It's just not worth it. At the end of the day, again, we're out here fishing for fun. You know, it's not worth risking somebody's life or your own life for it. Do I know Eric Nelson? Don't know Eric. I'm, I might be friends with him on Facebook. I don't really know him directly there. Um, Mike says, what about the bigger Ned rigs? I do throw a bigger Ned rig, but I just kind of call it a shaky head. I don't really throw it on a mushroom head. To me, if it's a bigger um, stick bait like that, I'm going to end up running a, uh, I'm going to run like a, one of those MGC custom tackle heads on there. It tends to be the better one. Bass Lives Matter, Bass Attitude, baby. That's right. Y'all need to go down and check out Chris, Bass Attitude Fishing. It's where I get the uh, the hats and everything. Chris is awesome, guys. Helped me out a ton. And uh, awesome merchandise. He's got the Bass Attitude stuff. He's got the Bass Quest stuff, which is my hats and things like that. And all Alex Rudd and... Uh, Mikey Balls' gear as well. Y'all need to check him out. Let's see here. I'm going to start pushing down into some more. What's up? (laughs) Bass Attitude, Hidden Harbor is the juice. (laughs) Did you catch him today, dude? Let me know, Chris. Let me know in the comments down there if you caught him today. Rich says the, uh, the rain needs to stop. Yeah. The rain can put a damper on things. It kind of stinks for me because it's hard to film in the rain and stuff. But it's amazing to me how many days. Sunday, I went out with uh, the Open Series guy. or Yeah, he fishes Coast as Brian Elder. And we fished in the back of a creek and pulled up on a spot, caught like 25 pounds right there. Super easy. So the rain doesn't necessarily hurt the fishing at all. Let's see here.
any more questions on there? Um, let's see here. Crawlin says he's going to come down for fishing in March. Any recommendation for areas to try fishing? You're in March. You know, this fish, they're in full-blown pre-spawn. There's going to be a lot of fish shallow, main lake stuff, flats. They're going to be in little pockets on the main lake. They're going to be pushed back into creeks, usually the, the second third or the last third of creeks, all that stuff. There's a lot of it. When these fish push shallow and they're in spawning areas, getting around spawning areas, they're, the lake tends to fish a little bit bigger it's a really good time of the year to come down cover water fish a lot of different stuff and catch some fish so you should have a good time in march assuming you don't get here on like a really bad cold front or something like that let's see here um sean says if it keeps raining like it's supposed to the rest of the week the bite can be really tough i agree with that but to me I'm looking at the weather and I'm seeing warm weather and I'm seeing the potential for extreme rises in water. If I'm getting warm, very high water, I'm going to be out on the lake. It's an awesome time to catch a ton of fish. Um, they'll get in really particular, like uh, predictable areas, current breaks in you know, certain areas and creeks, backwaters and stuff. You can really get back there, pinpoint where those fish will be. They'll be. It's kind of like trout fishing. You'll know right where they're supposed to be, set up and start really firing in and catching those fish. Scott says he's going to be on the water either way. That's my man right there. You got to keep after him. Can't catch him from the couch. <clears throat> Are there any baits you don't see people use on chick, lizards, topwater, frogs, any in particular? I mean, the only thing I don't see people use on chickamauga anymore is just like really old stuff. You know, like I, I don't see as many people throwing around just a smoke grub or anything like that anymore. Some of the stuff that is kind of lost with time, I don't see as many people throwing a spinner bait anymore, which is funny to me because you know, spinnerbaits still catch the crap out of fish. You know, most guys are throwing a rig or they're throwing a chatterbait. So to me, that's something going back and, and fishing something, you know, a bait that's discontinued or, you know, a technique that a lot of people don't use anymore can be a great way to catch fish. But as far as actual plastics, actual techniques, most everything is thrown on this lake. There's so many guys fishing it, so many different styles of fishing. These fish have seen everything in the kitchen sink. Um, Jim says, if the lake is pulled down because of all the rain, will the fish be moving into pre-spawn areas or water is in the 50s? Um, the, the fish are going to be, this time of year, regardless of how cold, even if it gets 38 degree water temperatures, if we get a huge cold front, those fish are still going to be moving into shallow areas. It's hardwired into their system. Even if the water's running up and down, they'll pull out a little bit and pull right back up. They want to be shallow. Um, Braden says, I had a tournament at the start of uh, March, caught them on rocks with cranks. Yep, that's a great pattern in March. It's a great pattern a lot of times of the year. In the wintertime, too, you can pull up to areas, especially, you know, on the west side of the lake, it gets a lot of that evening sun. You can pull over there, you know, throw a small body crankbait right along the bluff wall and catch fish. Rich says, uh, what two baits would I throw this weekend? Um, assuming, this is in my mind, you know, I'm thinking by this weekend, you're going to have extremely muddy water. So in, if I'm going and fishing really muddy water areas, big spinnerbait, square bill, and a jig. So that's three. And then if I'm in stained water, I'm going to fish probably a trap or uh, a rig, something like that. That'd probably be about right. Mark says he's got a new website, maddogcustomlures.com. Check him out. I've seen, I've been looking at a lot of Mark's stuff. We need to get together still, buddy. But I've been looking at a lot of his stuff. He's got some awesome custom painted baits on there. Again, we're talking about doing something different, right? Having somebody custom paint up some baits to look like some older baits that you have that used to work really well, or maybe just some new cool styles can be a great way to catch fish. Douglas says you got a tournament Saturday, water's high, rainy. Any recommendations? Again, I would say, you know, look for current breaks, look for areas there should be a fish, they should be pushed up. If it's really stained, or not really stained, really muddy, we'll go with that, then those fish are going to be tight to cover. So you'll know where the fish are. It might take five flips in there with a jig to get them to buy it, but at least you know where they're at. Same thing with stained water. They tend to group up a little bit closer together, and they'll be on like a hard spot out there offshore, so you can catch them like that as well. T 
Twig says he's going to Gville Saturday, 70 degree storms. Buzzbait, maybe. With that kind of grass, if they're pushed up ultra shallow. Um, buzzbait, though, I would go, uh, Saudi Custom makes an awesome one for me. It's a it's a finesse buzzbait. It's got a much smaller blade, but a regular size buzzbait. And I'll put like a Kitek on it, Kitek style trailer. And uh, that tends to work really awesome for me. I'll sit there, fire that thing out there, and it you can still crawl it. It stays up in the water column with that uh, Kitek on there, so you don't you can reel it really slow. But it's got a really finessey sound to it. It's not that big, top top top, you know, loud um, buzz bait. It's really finessey, and it can get those fish to come unglued. I don't know if they'll be going on that. I'd say if you have water temps in that 50 to 55 range, you got a pretty good shot at it. If it's up above that, you got a really good shot at it. Um, Brandon says, what area of Chickamauga do I think is better during heavy rain periods like we're having now? Um, keep the videos coming. Yeah, definitely going to keep the videos coming. As far as areas of the lake, um, when you're getting this much rain, this much current, I like to find areas of the lake that are wider. So the areas that have more flats that are much wider areas, those areas, they're going to be, they'll have spots that are protected by current. You'll have different water clarities typically in those kind of areas. So you can kind of pick your poison and, and find the fish on little current breaks. That's what I typically like to do. Um, I'll go into the wider, deeper creeks, tend to be a little bit better in my opinion during, during that time. So just kind of keep an eye on that. Yep, uh, Brian says the earliest topwater bite that can be replicated is definitely the buzz bait. I mean, I, I made a funny video last year in February. I think it was like February 7th last year. I went out and caught a fish on a buzz bait in the back of a creek. And that was kind of cool. Um, we had random warm front came in. The water temps got up around 55 or something. They were, I could see them munching shallow. And I was like, man, I bet I could get one to eat this thing. Sure enough, I got a bite and then I caught one. Then I switched over and started catching more fish. It took me forever to do it, but pretty neat. Let's see here. Ooh, Fish and Flea says he picked up a couple custom traps that look like crappie. That's a good thing, man. I'm telling you, those big ones like to eat those crappie. Could be the could be the deal for you there. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, Tony says, do I know of a heavy spinner bait in that three quarter to one ounce with a smaller profile? I really I can't think off the top of my head. Again, that's probably something I would go to the guys, maybe talk to Brad. Or Mark down there at Saudi Custom, see if they could build you one up. Um, I think uh, Scott over at Hog Farmer could probably do it too. Again, for me, profile is not that big of an issue on uh, on a spinnerbait. To me, in order to get the profile smaller, I would cut down the skirt a little bit and probably run it, or just take the skirt off completely and run a swim bait on it. You can get the profile looking much smaller like that. But I like uh, kind of a bulky profile on my spinner baits. Honestly, I like to have a, a bigger creature bait or a swim bait on the back of them. I like to upgrade to bigger blades in a lot of cases. Shiloh says, hi, Dad. Hi, Shiloh. Hi, Tristan. My kids are watching in the next room over there. Let's see here. What else we got for questions on here? Ooh, Hank says he's ready to come down. Should be free in a couple of days. Let's go, dude. I don't know if it's going to be worth a dang with all these changing weather conditions, but heck, we can get out there and try it. Not going to be prime, but you never know. Stumble across a big one. To me, it, you know, high, dirty water, those big fish, they're moving to areas they're not used to being. They're seeing baits in areas they're not used to seeing them. And they, you know, a lot of their senses are dull. They've got current to work with, they've got the dirty water to work with. It's the best time to get one of those giant fish to mess up. You saw that video of that 14-2, the guy caught that during the rain in kind of muddy water conditions. Pretty cool. John Z says, big baits catch big fish. That's true, but two of the 10-pounders I've caught on this lake, I've caught on six-pound test lines. So <laughs> little tiny stuff catches big fish too. It just depends on confidence and being in the right place at the right time. Does it, um, let's see here. Vangi Yang 23 says, does the current pick up on Chick with all this rain? It's rolling right now. Rolling. It's it's definitely kicking down through there. Um, Randy says Yankum is making a good spinner, but you have to show those to me, Randy. I ain't seen those yet. Mm-hmm. 
Let's see. Um, Braden says, what would be my go-to um, when the fish are on beds? I'm not a huge bed fisherman, to be honest with you. Um, it's not something I typically like to do. A lot of times if the fish are new on a bed, you can sit there and flip just about anything on them and get them to bite it. Um, one of my favorite techniques, if I am going to have to ledge fish, the hog farmer makes a tied stand-up shaky head. So in other words, it's a hair jig, but it's a, it's a shaky head. You take a little piece of plastic, and it covers this you know, good size EWG hook, but he makes a white one. And the benefit of that to me is it's something that you can sit in the bed and that hair, any kind of current or any time that fish comes up to it, a lot of times they'll blow or puff on whatever is in their bed to get it to move. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to shake it. It'll sit there and move on its own as that fish moves around it. And they'll literally piss themselves off and go and end up eating that thing. Hank, get down here, man. I'll fish with you. Let's do it. See here, <laughs> Jeremy says the fish were biting good at the parking lot of fishtails. I don't know if you're joking or not, but that would be awesome. See here, Joe says, Are we still on for tomorrow? I think so, dude. Should be. Let's do it. Um, BA Fishing says the water getting muddy down there. A lot of it's muddy. A lot of it's stained. There's still some pockets of clear water. I don't know how it's looking, though. I haven't been out in a couple days, so it's hard to say what it's looking like after all this rain. Mr. Sport 77, my kids are really excited and ready to catch some bass. What kind of bait would you recommend uh, putting in their hands just to try to catch some fish in the boat, not caring about the size? Um, if you're wanting to fish, you know, obviously the, one of the best ways that you can just go out and catch fish, go get some shiner somewhere and uh, float them out there. You'll catch crappie, you'll catch bass doing that. And I would honestly, if you're bringing younger guys out that don't have a whole lot of experience, that's just an awesome way to have it as a backup anyway. You know, say the fish are not eating artificial, it's not working out. You can always pull up that live bait and have a pretty good chance of catching some fish in these areas. So I would bring some live bait with you. Um, I would also take, just to catch some fish, you take a little quarter ounce red eye shad or a quarter ounce booyah. Um, in this dirtier water, you're probably looking at sartreuse or red and tie it on a spinning rod. Just about anybody can fish that. You can hop it along the bottom. You can burn, stop it. You can straight retrieve it, and you're going to catch fish on that thing. Um, another thing would be a smoke grub this time of year, like a really dark smoke grub. Um, that'll catch fish pretty much no matter what. Um, if you're around a school of fish, a drop shot can be awesome. So just things like that. And the thing is about a drop shot, if you're not experienced fisherman, it's a really high maintenance technique. Every time you catch a fish on it, it tangles up pretty bad. So I don't know if that would be the best bet or not. I would try to stick to moving baits if you can. John says rooster tail. Rooster tail is a killer, especially you get a, a bigger one. You fish it on these flats, you'll catch a bunch of bass on a rooster tail. That is an awesome inline spinner. Awesome. Any more questions on there? Yeah, hopefully Joe and I can get on for you tomorrow. We'll see. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, holler at me, dude. I think you got my number. Text me and we'll figure out a time to get together. I know it's been kind of on and off. I'm horrible. You guys, I'm horrible to get a hold of, you know, people trying to fish with me and stuff. Joe, Joe and Randy know all about that. I'm all over the place. I got work to do and a million people that I'm fishing with and it just gets hectic sometimes. Douglas says, still waiting on a swim bait video. You'll be waiting on a little while for that one. Um, there's, there's some secrets I don't want to give away. A lot of stuff I've learned from people that are not my ideas. So I'm not, a lot of that stuff is not going to get shared until I get the okay from people to share it. Um, I'll probably do some stuff on that in the future, but not a whole lot. Jig video. Yes, jig video is coming up. I've got an awesome, you know, finesse jig. I've got some awesome footage with that. I'm going to be sticking together a full, like one of those breakdown videos, complete guides with the jig and hopefully a jerk bait coming up. If we can ever get some clean water, I love to fish jerk bait, but I haven't had clean enough water to really get on an awesome, awesome jerk bait bite yet. So y'all have to stay tuned for that. As soon as it happens, we'll get a video together for it. Any other techniques that y'all want to see? videos i know i'll probably do some big swim bait stuff probably not all of it right away but uh just let me know some ideas for those kind of deals
Joe says he caught three fish when it was sleeting yesterday. You're a tough man, Joe, being out there in that. that that's the coldest thing ever. I always tell people, I will go out and fish in the snow. It can be blizzarding out there any day of the week. But when it's sleeting out there, man, that is miserable. It's amazing how cold you get with a cold rain or sleet. It's cold, cold. Let's see here. The Heavy Z Lipless Basque. Yes, yes, I have seen that. That's uh, from Pro Z. Uh, no, not Pro Z. Uh, Profound Outdoors, right? It's the, the, what's his name? Ah, Timmy Horton. Is that who? It, yeah, it's like, it's from them. Hank's talking about a certain lipless. I have seen that, and that thing looks awesome. They have awesome paint jobs. Again, it's kind of got that LV 500 profile, um, heavier bait, smaller profile. I think that thing will work really good. I'm looking forward to grabbing a couple of them. Braden says you use a, go to Parksville and use a, a jerk bait and a drop shot. That's a good idea. That's a, a great thing. You know, I, I probably ought to run up there. I could probably shoot a jerk bait video and a drop shot video up there. Thank you for that, Braden. Um, oh, Mark, Mark just asked an awesome question. He says, have you caught rig fish in muddy water? Um, when do you start launching big swim baits? Does warm water increase the odds? Um, muddy water for me, I have not had as much success with a rig, and I don't know why. To me, it's a giant uh, spinner bait, and it has more presence in the water than a spinner bait. But I outfish a rig constantly when it's super dirty water with just a regular spinner baits. I don't know. Just, it hasn't become a confidence thing for me. I don't know if I just need to get way more crazy with it and audacious with the uh, blades, maybe do Colorado blades. I don't know. I just can't really get them to go as well. As far as launching big swim baits, I uh, answered that question up further, you know, back a little ways. Typically, um, 50s to 60s if you're going to try to fish a bigger swim bait. Fishing Fleet, Bobbird Nightcrawler video. Yeah, heck yeah. I, uh, Chris and I, we've been talking seriously. I've got a, an area that I can go catch great big shiners. I've done it for years, and I haven't really shot any video on it, but I'm going to go throw it at some shiners pretty uh, soon and balloon them out. I think that would make a cool video for you guys. Probably catch some giant fish on it too. Um, David says, can you tell me the best trap rod to buy for around $100 from Ohio? Um. For a hundred bucks, a trap rod. I mean, I I've been using that uh, Okuma TCS trap slash jerk bait, that seven footer. I don't know if I really recommend it though. I mean, it, it is a good rod, but I don't know if I really want to. Just customer service from Okuma and other things about that whole situation. I'm not really sure if I want to support that much. I would recommend um, getting a rod similar to that. What what I mean by that is, I like a graphite blank. So you're looking at a seven to seven three, maybe even seven six if you're a taller guy, um, and you want a graphite rod, not a glass rod. I don't like glass rods. I lose so many fish on it. It might be your thing. It's not mine. A graphite rod, medium heavy, and I'm gonna go with a moderate action. That tends to be the best setup for me. It, it's just enough where I can go ahead and, and rip those uh, lipless baits out, but it's also moderate enough where I can keep those fish on. Yeah, Hank, Hank, I need to get you some of uh, Scott's hog farmer stuff as far as those rigs. You need to try out his rigs because, in my opinion, they, they're they a lot better than those young umbrellas. And I, I do switch the blades out. Scott has a lot of rigs with smaller blades on them. Um, I get some crazy different blades on there, and I'll switch to much bigger blades on it. You'll see. You need to come down here and fish, and I'll show you some of the cool rigs I've got set up. Scott says, <laughs> Parksville has no fish. Exactly right. There are no fish in Parksville Lake. You're correct. Um, Sean says Dobbins Fury. Dobbins Fury it is hard to beat the Dobbins Fury for a hundred dollar rod. As far as their lipless rod or a rod similar for that, I don't know if they've got one that I would use or not. Hold on just one second here. I'll tell you what, we're gonna do a little shopping here. Let's see what we got. Look down through here. Looking at seven foot. Fast action, not what we want, not what we want.
I'm looking down through for a moderate action here. See a lot of these, there's moderate fast. Yeah, I might have missed might have missed one then. Looking down through here. This is probably boring for you guys to watch. I'm just curious now. Let's see here. Here's one. Yeah, they have a 705 CB. Moderate, fast action, medium, heavy. Right here. This is the one I would get. Seven footer. The FR705 CB. Boom. See if they've got any more. No, that's the only CB. But yeah, that one would be perfect probably for that. You should be able to throw uh, crankbaits and jerkbaits on that. I'll probably actually pick one of those rods. Um, I'm looking at some loose rods also, so we'll see. Ba ba ba. Let's see what have we got. Bass Live says too moderate and lose your sensitivity unless you're throwing more expensive rod. Um, yeah, I agree. I think the glass in general, you get too much glass in a rod, you're going to lose a lot of sensitivity with it. When bass are super shallow, are there tons of people throwing traps? Dude, there's tons of people throwing traps all the time. Yep, lots of them. Randy says Joe burns custom rods, and I do recommend. Um, I actually was fortunate enough, I never do that, but I won a raffle um, when I was at that tournament over there and got one of Joe Burns' rods in the raffle. And I think most of his rods are in the $150 range. But yeah, I got a 7.3, I think it was a medium heavy action. It's like a jig or worm rod, and I'm loving that thing so far. I actually threw a spinner bait on it and a uh, one of those, what do you call it? MGC Custom Hack with the mag shaky heads with a, a two backs on there on Sunday, and I actually love that rod. I'm probably going to have Joe build me a crankbait rod just to see how that is. Sean has a good place hookup for Dobbins rods. So Y'all check that out. Yeah, uh, Hank, I agree with you. I, Somebody comment down below. If there's anybody here that really likes the glass rods, comment why you like them. Um, for me personally, a lot of guys say that it'll help the fish eat the bait more um, and that, you know, it's so moderate and flimsy that the fish will stay on. They won't get off. My problem with it is I lose so many fish. And I think one of the problems is it, it lacks tons of sensitivity. You don't get near as much sensitivity through the glass as you do the graphite. So I feel like I'm late to hook set, and a lot of times that fish is already getting rid of the bait. And then number two is when I swing on that fish, I don't know if it's just my personal preference, but maybe I'm not swinging hard enough, but I've felt like I've really put some, you know, power into it, and I still can't get a hold of those fish. I can't, I don't feel like I'm sinking the hooks all the way, and I don't feel like I can get those fish all the way to the boat. Braden says, where do I normally put in at? I put it in a lot of different places on the lake. Typically, I put it at around Chester Frost, um, Saudi Creek, uh, Sail Creek, Possum Creek. Those are typically kind of mid-lake areas is where I put in because it's just close to where I live, but I run all over the lake and fish it. A lot of times I fish from Watts Bar Dam all the way down to Chickamauga Dam. So. Brian says, I think it's better for a chatterbait to throw a composite rod. I just don't know. I mean, to me, I can get a graphite rod that's got a moderate action, you know, moderate fast, and I'll be way more confident fishing it. Just, again, I think it comes down to personal preference. Um, Douglas, that's the same thing. I think it's too much flex, and I can't get the hooks in. I guess if you're a guy that's like a really, like a power fisherman, you know, from Florida that fishes a ton of big line, big weights and stuff, and just likes to ram a hook set home, uh, maybe that glass rod would be a better option for you, but I just hate that you don't have the feel with it. Um, let's see here. Tony says, what line do I prefer to throw on the trap? 
and on a uh, spinner bait on mono or fluoro um, pound test. My favorite line that I've come to use, let me see. Darn it, I don't have it sitting right here. All right, we're gonna look at it though. Let's see here. You guys need to check this stuff out because it is absolutely awesome. Look at that crazy screen right there. <laughs> All right. Canine Fishing Line. It's a, uh, I think they're out of Kentucky, but I got this down, this stuff right here, the Canine Fluoro Super Strong. Now it says Fluoro on here, but what this is, it is a blend. It's not really like most co polymers, though. It has more of the components of the fluorocarbon than a lot of other co polymers do. All it basically is is a true fluorocarbon with a little bit of nylon added to it. What that nylon does, it's going to give that fluorocarbon a little bit more stretch, and it also is going to keep that memory down. This stuff will last forever on a spool. It's extremely abrasive resistant. Um, the knots hold really well with it. Um, I've been throwing it like crazy. I've thrown it below dams, wiggle warts, running over rocks and stuff like that. Hadn't had any trouble with it. And I think it's excellent for moving baits. And again, you cannot beat this price. It's priced a lot more like a copolymer. 550 yards, $19. You can't beat that. And I'm amazed again at how long this stuff will stay on a spool and and not be crappy when it comes off. You know, a lot of other copolymers use it a couple times. Next time you throw it out there, it's so cooled up. You've got so much memory on that line that you don't have any feel anymore. This stuff, in my opinion, is the best of both worlds. I want to do that. Do that. <laughs> But anyway, y'all need to check this stuff out. He makes a 100% uh, fluorocarbon. I have not used it yet. I've got, you know, it's more standard pricing on there. I've not used this stuff. I've got a spool of it. I'm about to spool on there. And he also has an awesome braid. Um, for me, for traps and a spinner bait, I'm going to use any kind of moving bait. I'm going to use this canine, this, this blended line with this nylon in there. I'm going to use that because I've got a little bit more stretch. And I'm not going to have as many problems with it. Um, for traps, I typically sit around that 12 to 14 pound test, depending on the size of the trap. For spinner baits, 15 to 17 pound test. If I'm fishing a spinner bait in extreme cover, you know, like with this muddy water coming up, if I'm throwing right into laydowns and stuff like that, I'll probably bump on up to 20. All right. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Um, Bass Lives Matter. Uh, Brian, yes, I'm using OBS for the streaming. Oh, I didn't know uh, Kyle Welcher was using the K9. Yeah, a lot of guys around here are using that stuff. Um, he, I, just a cool guy. I got to sit there. I sat there and talked with the owner of the company. Just a really cool guy. He's very confident in his product. Um, you can tell he's put a lot of thought and a lot of time and effort and energy into it. And I just, I'm really digging it so far. Cameron says, Canine Line. You guys need to check out. I'm telling you. Um, he gave me a link. I'll see if I can link that down in the description, but. Yeah, he gave me like a, a link for a discount code for that for you guys too. So I'll try to use that down there. Yeah, he says, yeah, you're liking the new Fish the Moment style videos. That's another thing. You know, these kind of videos, these educational videos, I'll just go out and say these are not my idea. Um, Johnny Schultz, I've been watching his channel for a while. He does a lot of videos very similar to this. Y'all go check it out. It's literally called Fish the Moment. Um, YouTube videos. He has a lot of good information. He fishes, I think he he's Oklahoma is his home lakes. So a lot different lakes than me. So that's why I decided to kind of fill in this gap, Tennessee River, and do similar videos to what he's doing. Mike Christian says, canine is made in Tennessee. That's awesome. Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed. I have a lot less break-offs. Uh, I set the hook pretty hard in a lot of cases, and I think that uh, softer line with a little bit more stretch, especially on my moving baits, has helped me. And also when those fish are surging right at the boat there, I think that makes a pretty big difference on there. Go back over to this. Y'all can look at my face. <laughs> Kyle said he hadn't tested enough yet. I think he'll like it. 
I, I think a lot of guys, I, I don't think that anyone would pick that stuff up and not like it. Again, I have not tried their 100% fluorocarbon. Um, the 100% fluorocarbon that I've used in the past is Gamma, and I really like that stuff. I have not been as big a fan of Seaguar or Sunline. To me, once I picked up Gamma, it was just love it, first sight, you know, or whatever you want to call it. But uh, that for fishing, any kind of bottom bait, anything that you need a lot of sensitivity, low stretch, that Gamma has been awesome for me. But I'm super excited to try the Canine because I've heard it's pretty similar. It's very tough. Um, but anytime you get into a line that's a lot tougher like that, a lot lower um, stretch, um, stuff like that, what you're going to end up with is a line that has more memory. And there's just nothing you can do about it. That's why a lot of times when I'm using 100% floral, I use it as a leader with braid. If you're using it swollen, it's sprayed, uh, straight on a spool, especially really bigger line sizes than a 17, 20 pound test. It can make it difficult to, to cast really far. And you don't get as much of it on a spool. Douglas, yeah, you're right. Fish the moment. Uh, Johnny has a lot of good offshore vids. I'm going to hopefully get to do several of those um, coming this summer and kind of gear it more again towards the Tennessee River ledge fishing. <laughs> No, Brian, you hadn't told me about those HUD fish. Let me know about it. Sean, you say that you love the, the Sunlight Sniper FC. I've had two spools of it, and I haven't had really great results with both. And it could be, again, it could just be that I got a couple bad spools of it. So that could very well be it. Scott said you like the map review best. I'm going to do a lot more of those, and I'm going to start doing different lakes too. Uh, I'm going to branch out from the Tennessee River into more highland type reservoirs into smaller bodies of water because I feel like a lot of a lot of you guys probably fish a lot of smaller bodies of water like ponds and things like that. And there's a lot you can learn from Navionics and the uh, Google Earth on those smaller bodies of water. Um, let's see here. What's the best place to flip on Chickamauga in March? Like flipping jigs? Um, to me, again, you're following the fish. Where are they at in the cycle? If you're in March, pre-spawn, they're probably going to be way up on the flats. They're going to be in main lake pockets. They're going to be towards the back of creeks. So anytime you get into those type areas and you see good visible cover, you know, like a big lay down, an offshore lay down or stumps or things like that, that's probably a, a likely place that you could flip up a fish. In March, the, the water sometimes late March, the water is moving up. So sometimes you'll get enough water onto some of the docks where you can flip docks as well. Yeah, I'm serious, guys. Pick up some of that canine. That stuff is awesome. Uh, where do you think the fish will be setting up by the time the big bass splash kicks off? That's a good question. I, that is such a big toss up. And that's why, again, I haven't committed to fishing it yet. Um, I just don't know. You know, there's a whole lot of things that could be happening. What I'm afraid of is we're going to get all this rain. The water's going to get all the way up to summer pool, right? Well, towards the end of next week, we're going to have a cold front that comes in. So you're going to have a cold front. You're going to have water that's probably dropping dramatically as they try to get it back down to winter pool. And then you're going to have, you know, in combination with that, you're going to have dirty water because of all the current to get that out of there. So it could just, it could set up to be a really tough tournament, but it could be really good too. I don't know. I'm going to fish um, tomorrow and sometime next week and then make a decision after that. Chris says, oh, I picked up the War Pigs yet. No, I'm not. That's another one kind of on my list of lipless crate baits to try. I've not picked one up yet. Don't know anything about those. All right, guys, we're an hour and 18 minutes in. I didn't even realize it. I'm going to start wrapping it up here pretty soon. Last second questions. Anybody, fire. Um, let's see here. Do I think it matters greatly on Chickamauga if I fish a lure against the normal current? When you say against, I'm assuming you're saying pulling it against the current. In other words, pulling it upstream. Um, to me, in most cases, pulling a your bait with the current is the best way to do it because it naturally presents that um, bait to the fish. The exceptions to that are, in a lot of cases, what will happen if you're running extreme current, it'll create a reverse eddy near the bank. And if the fish are sitting in that reverse eddy, it can actually pay to sit upstream and fire into it and pull it what would be against the main current but with the secondary current. So you have to kind of think of that in the back of your mind as well. Your fishing eddy line doesn't necessarily matter because your current's going to be swirling in that area. 
So just hitting it at different angles can be effective. Yeah, it looks like we got a few more subscribers. Guys, I'm trying to get to 4,000 subscribers by, or sorry, not 4,000, 5,000 by the Classic, which is just a few weeks away now. So any help y'all can give me would be great. If y'all want to share it up, share the videos up, that'd be super helpful to me. Da -da 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 -da. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Favorite bait. Oh, geez, I have no idea. I like to fish a whole lot of different things. Let's just say crankbaits. Crankbaits are my favorite bait to fish. All kinds of crankbaits. Depending on the year, there's, there's different ones that you can fish in different conditions, but I just like it because it's faster fishing. Da -da -da, ba -da. Any luck on plastics in the pre-spawn, Texas rig, Carolina rig? I have had ex excellent success in the later pre-spawn on a Carolina rig in shallow water. Um, and other plastics, flipping plastics can be awesome, especially if you, a lot of guys are flipping jigs to go back through with a plastic or a creature bait, you can do really well. Where can I get some good barbecue near Chickamauga? Going to be there 27th to 31st. Oh, geez, man. If you're going to be in Dayton, go hit up the Screen Door Restaurant down there. That's probably going to be one of your best bets. Um, trying to think of some other good ones around here. A lot of the best barbecues to have in Nashville. You might have to make it dry. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the. Ribbon loin. Ribbon loin is pretty good. Brian, don't be telling somebody about my Carolina rig lizard. That works really good. Predictions for the classic. It's loud. <laughs> it's not going to be anything like Chickamauga. It's going to take... 12 pounds a day something like that to do well in that tournament um i'll tell you uh, insider knowledge i went out with jeremiah johnson he's the guy that films this some of the strike king videos like fish hard and the pro team journal that you can find on outdoor channel went out and we tried to film a video on chickamauga ended up getting here right during a cold front bunch of sleet and stuff didn't really work out caught a bunch of fish but not really the size i don't know if they're going to end up doing a video with that or not but his cameraman had just come from um, filming with Denny Brower and they were on loud and trying to like I guess fish a little bit up there and do a little bit of filming as a prereq for the classic and everything and he said that they caught very few fish and the biggest one was like two pounds so that that'll tell you kind of how the classic's gonna go uh, Mark says I throw any magnum square bills any recommendations I have gotten into it a little bit I got a couple big bites on it I felt like the other day but I didn't get either one of them to the boat so I, I don't know Recommendations, I would recommend throwing it on like a 7.6 swim bait rod. Like a, I, I threw it on that Mark Rose, that Ledge Series 7.6 swim bait rod. It's like a 7 foot, um, 6 inch, and it's a moderate but heavy action rod. And that worked really good for that. How many hooks do I have in my rig in Tennessee? Three hooks. You can have three hooks on t in Tennessee. Michael says to get 20 pounds a couple years ago. I, I agree with that. I mean, there's always potential to catch a, a decent bag up there, especially if you're in the tailwaters. But just for the purposes of the tournament, time of year when those fish are moving like that, I'd be really surprised to see anybody weigh in 16 to 18 pounds. Just, just my opinion. This is going to be a lot of smaller fish that are caught. Da, 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 da. Heck yeah, we'll do some striper fishing, dude. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> All right, guys, y'all have a good night. Main Lake or Creeks? Both. Both right now. You got you to gotta remember, a lot of the population of fish will spawn on the main lake. A lot of it will spawn in the creeks. So you can do both. Do I throw top water? I throw a lot of top water in April on Chickamauga. I'm thinking he probably meant striper instead of stripper. <laughs> All right, dude. We're going to wrap it up here. I guess I'll see y'all next time. I'm going to be doing these every Wednesday at 7. So I will see y'all next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Stay tuned. I don't know what we're going to be talking about yet, but it's going to be awesome. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Thanks for all the support. And uh, I'll catch you next time. Yeah, Brian, let's go out, dude. You and me get on the water.